By utilizing WebGL and harnessing the power of your computer's GPU, you can create some really awesome graphics for the web. And what's really cool is that you can take these awesome shaders and use them in your Phaser 3 games. And with the power of WebGL, you can create all kinds of different shaders. So, so we can do things like render out just basic colors. Uh, we can use alpha to do things like a grayscale. Uh, we can do gradients. We can do shapes. We can make some awesome designs and patterns by using your code, uh, like these here. You can also do some generative designs and much, much more. Besides these, we can also do realistic effects like this fire effect here and awesome designs like this one here. So as you can see, shaders are really awesome, and using these shaders in your Phaser 3 games has never been easier. Today, I'll be showing you how you can get started with adding shaders to your Phaser 3 games. Before we dive into the code, I'll be doing a high-level overview of what shaders are, provide some background on GL GLSL, and review some of the basics of how to create shaders. I'll also be sharing some links to some excellent resources if you're interested in learning more about shaders and, GL and GLSL. If you're already familiar with shaders and the basics of G GLSL, no worries. There will be timestamps in the description of the video below, and you should be able to jump ahead to the next section if you want to jump right into the phaser code. So let's get started. So what are shaders? Basically, shaders are really cool effects that you can apply to a graphical scene. A more traditional definition is shaders are small programs that will run on your GPU, so your graphics processing unit, and they are used to control the rendering process in your computer graphics. And so shaders are essential components in modern graphics programming and are used to perform various tasks such as vertex transformation, pixel color calculations, and other graphics related computations. They are responsible for creating your realistic lighting effects, shadows, reflections, and more in your computer graphics. And so we'll see a lot of these in our games. And so there are two main types of shaders, uh, fragment and vertex shaders. Fragment, otherwise known as your pixel shaders, are your shaders that operate on each pixel of your rendered image. And so as an example, when we're rendering out this canvas element here, each of our pixels are being rendered out by our fragment shader. And so each one is calculated individually. So your fragment shader, they will determine your final color and other attributes of each pixel on your screen. And these are crucial for implementing your effects like lighting, shading, and post-processing effects uh, when you render out to your canvas. Vertex shaders, on the other hand, these shaders will operate on each vertex of a 3D model. They're responsible for transforming your 3D coordinates of the vertices into your 2D screen coordinates. And that's how you get some really cool effects because since our screen's only 2D, we need a way to map that. And vertex shaders are also used for other tasks such as skinning when you do like things like character animation. And so for this video, we're just going to go ahead and focus on our fragment shaders. The reason shaders are so powerful is that one or more shaders can be applied to all of the pixels on your screen, and each pixel is being modified in parallel and independently of each other. So when our shader runs, in order to get this effect, they're all each of these pixels is processed in parallel, so then that way we get our final design here. Likewise, if you're using multiple shaders in your scene, each of those shaders are going to process your pixels and work together to create really cool effects like this. And so this is all possible thanks to your computer's GPU. As an example, a basic fragment shader could be that you set the color of each pixel to black and when applied to all pixels, we would have a black screen. If you want to do something more interesting, if we set the color proportionally to our X value, we could create a very simple gradient like this grayscale one here. So how does this all work? So in order to actually create our shaders for the web and to use our shaders with Phaser 3, this is all made possible due to WebGL or the Web Graphics Library. WebGL is a JavaScript API for rendering high-performance interactive 3D and 2D graphics with any compatible web browser without the use of plugins. WebGL does so by introducing an API that closely conforms to the OpenGL ES 2.0. OpenGL is a shading language that is very similar to your C programming language, and this is specifically made for writing shaders. This is typically known as GLSL code, and we can utilize Phaser 3 WebGL mode to use this code. Uh, so as an example, it'd be like this code here that you can see on my screen. So now that we have reviewed what shaders are, let's take a look at a basic shader program and go over what each part of the program does. So every shader should contain a main function. So your main function, this is going to be called for every single pixel that's being rendered out for our WebGL image. And at the end of all your computations, we can set the color of that pixel that's going to be rendered by setting the GL frag color variable here uh, to some value. 
and in Shaderland, colors are represented as vectors of the form red, green, blue, and alpha. So your RGB and then your A for if you want to be transparent or not. And so with our color here represented as vector four, that's how we get this color here. And so as an example, if I just wanted to go ahead and do black, I can do zero for my three values. And what we'll get is this effect here. And so our different values here uh, between zero and one are just going to indicate the amount of that particular color. So our red, green, and blue to mix together and our overall alpha to get our transparency. Uh, so as an example, if I just go ahead and play around with some of our settings here, we can see we can get different colors by mixing together these various levels. Likewise, if we go ahead and modify our alpha, so if I do like 0 0.8, you'll see here it's going to use less color and it's going to get darker for our opacity. And so at the top of our program, we're going to see this line of code here. So if def, this is basically an if statement. And in this example, we're only inserting this line of code if GLES is defined. And so one of the main uh, types you'll be using in your program is going to be a float. And your float types are vital in shaders uh, because they give you a level of precision when you're rendering out, which is very crucial to create the type of effects we're looking for. And so lower precision means you'll have faster rendering, but the quality of your render is going to be worse. Versus if you have higher precision, uh, it's going to take more to render it out and it's going to be slower, but you have a really quality image. You have a really quality scene that's being rendered. And so what's really cool is you can be picky and specify the precision of each variable that uses a floating point in your program. And so in the second line of code here, what we're doing is we're setting all of our floats to be medium precision. Uh, but you can also choose to set them to low or high if you want to affect all of your floats uh, in your program. And so another vital part of a shader is you need to be able to pass variables to your shader when it runs. And so in order to pass variables, what you need to do is you need to find them outside your main function here. So like these here, these are different variables that will get set. And by setting these variables, we can then reference them inside our main function to create some of our cool effects. And so we can also define our own custom functions that we like to use outside of our main functions, and then we can reference that code from our main function. And so a really good example of this is in this shader here, you'll see we have a bunch of additional variables and we have our own custom functions here defined with what gets returned. And then we reference those inside our main function here to do all of our calculations to create this uh, output. And so there are a number of built-in variables and textures that will provide you with your key functionality to create some very basic shaders. And so we won't go over all of these, but two main ones to call out and so one of the key ones is going to be this frag coordinate. And what this is, this is going to be the coordinate of our pixel that we are processing currently, which we will go ahead and render out. So another important one is going to be your texture 2D function. And what this does is it allows you to uh, grab the pixel or your color from a given texture, and then you can use this to modify the pixel of an image. And so it can also be used for basic things like if you load in a texture to your shader, you can go ahead and just render out that whole texture uh, to your scene. And so as I mentioned, we won't be doing a deep dive into shaders or going over all the things that you can do with them. However, there are some really good resources out there if you'd like to learn more. If you are interested in learning more or playing with shaders without jumping directly into code, I would recommend that you check out the following resources. And there'll be a link to these resources uh, in the description of this video. The first one is going to be the Book of Shaders. And so this is a really good resource for getting started with shaders and what they are, how you write your code, and um, just how to get started. A great website for playing with shaders and seeing some live examples is Shader Toy. And so what this site allows you to do is you can write your own shader code and then see the output immediately while you play around. One thing to note though is Shader Toy has some of its own custom functions and methods uh, that are built on top of the standard variables. And so it's going to give you some methods like texture here. This is going to be slightly different than the texture 2D that I referenced before. You can also browse some of their popular examples and you can see how those were created uh, just by using some simple code uh, to create your shader. And one additional resource that's really good is the WebGL fundamentals here. Uh, it goes over the WebGL basics and then it starts expanding into some more of the advanced topics. Uh, so I definitely recommend checking this out. And so one additional resource I do recommend checking out if you are interested in shaders with Phaser 3 
is the Phaser 3 Labs. And so the lab has a lot of examples of using shaders and how you can apply those to your camera, your game objects, and much more. And so as you can see here, these are just a bunch of different examples that use different types of shaders to create effects in our game. So now that we've covered the basics of shaders, now it's actually the time to jump into some code. And so if you would like to follow along, there will be a link to the starter code uh, for the example I'm sharing here in the description of this video. There will also be a link to the clear source code. And if you'd like to follow along with the code, go ahead and download the code now, extract the files, and open them in your favorite ID of choice. There will be instructions at the readme for how to set up and run the project. And so in the demo here, uh, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to start with a very basic Phaser 3 scene. And we're going to create a basic shader that's going to allow us to just render out a texture. And so we're just going to render out an image like this here. And so it looks like nothing special is happening in the scene, but what we're doing is we're applying a shader to our camera and we're just rendering out that raw texture. So we can begin to see how we can run code and see how it functions in terms of our Phaser 3 scene. After we do that, we'll take a look how we can start then using our shader to apply a basic color to each of our pixels. And so this is the same scene, but now we have a shader that's overriding the pixel that's being outputted just to have a raw color. Uh, from there, we'll look at some more advanced techniques like creating a grayscale effect uh, with a shader. And so we'll be taking our pixels and mixing it with a gray color to get this effect here. And then one more example we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to see how we can use variables with our shaders to create scene transitions like this, where we use our shader to apply this wipe effect to our scene. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and wrap up by taking a look at some of the built-in effects uh, that we have from Phaser. And so the Phaser 3 library has a number of uh, effects that you can apply to your game objects and your camera pipelines uh, that are already built in. And so if you want to get started with shaders, we can use some of that built-in code. All right, so if you are interested in following along, uh, please go ahead and open up your IDE now. And so in this starter code template, uh, there's going to be a bunch of different project files. And so at a high level, uh, so a few things to call out is our first one is going to be our public folder. This is going to have our custom assets that we'll be using to render out image game objects in our Phaser 3 scenes. Then under our source folder, this will have all of our core code and our main.ts file. This is going to be where we create our main Phaser 3 game. And we add in our Phaser 3 scenes and we go ahead and start our nothing post FX scene here. And so this is the entry into our web app. And under our no nothing post FX scene here, uh, basically what I've done is there are a number of different scenes. And basically for each scene, we go ahead and create an image game object. And there's some council log statements and comments of where we'll be adding code. Finally, what we've done for each scene is we've connected them together. So if you press the space key, uh, you should see some council log statements when you start the project. And we should see that we're uh, switching between each scene. All right, so to go ahead and get started with our first shader, uh, what we're going to go ahead and do is under our source folder, we'll go ahead and make a new uh, folder and we're going to call this uh, shaders. And so for our first shader, uh, we're going to go ahead and make a new file and we're just going to call this nothing post fx pipeline uh, .ts. And so in order to create a shader with phaser, uh, what we can do is we can extend or create an instance of one of the custom shader classes that are available. And so an example of this is we're going to go ahead and create what's called a post FX pipeline. And basically what this is, this is a special pipeline that's used for handling post processing effects in phaser. And what it does is it allows you to apply shaders to your game objects after we've already drawn them. And so typical examples of this could be useful if we want to do effects like bloom filters, blurs, light effects, or even color manipulation on our object after we've went ahead and rendered it out. And so one thing to know is when you use one of the built-in uh, pipelines of Phaser, um, they all reference uh, their own uh, vertex shader. And this allows you to go ahead and get access to various uh, built-in methods and variables. So then that way we can do things like know which pixel we're trying to render out to our Phaser scene. And it allows us to grab things like different textures. So in that way, if we're rendering out multiple textures, we can then render them differently depending on the shader we're building. And so this will make more sense as we dive more into the code, uh, but it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, so I do recommend checking out the docs if you want more details. All right, so to get to our other code, what we're going to do is we're going to export our new class. And so we'll do export class, and we're going to call this nothing post FX pipeline. And for our class, we want to go ahead and extend our built-in phaser class. We're going to use phaser. We're going to do our renderer. And then we're going to go ahead and do WebGL. And we want to do our pipelines. And from our pipelines, we want to go ahead and grab our post FX pipeline. And since we're extending that class, let's go ahead and add in our constructor. And we're going to get an instance of our phaser game. 
And then what we need to do is we need to call our super method since we're extending uh, that class. And so for this, we expect our WebGL pipeline configuration object. And so on this, we need to provide our phaser three game. All right, so then now what we need to do is with our pipeline, we need to define our shader program that we want to run with this uh, pipeline. And so this is going to be the equivalent of us actually writing that shader program and then loading that into our JavaScript file. So then that way Phaser can use WebGL to render out this code and uh, create our shader. And so what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to do const and we'll make a new variable. We're just going to call this frag for fragment since we're creating a fragment shader. And what we do is we need to set this equal to a string. So how WebGL works is we need to define all of our shader code uh, as a string and we pass that string to Phaser, which then we'll go ahead and parse that and then use that to create our shader program. Now we need to go ahead and add our shader code. And so the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna add a comment. We're just gonna say define, and we're gonna do our shader name. And we're just gonna call this nothing post tent. And so what this allows us to do, this just allows us to uh, provide some uh, documentation and a name for our shader, so that way it's unique. And we're just gonna go ahead and call our shader uh, nothing post tent. And then what we're going to go ahead and do is we'll add our if def uh, for our GLES uh, variable. And if it's defined, uh, we're going to go ahead and set the precision for all of our floats. And we're going to go ahead and do this and we're going to use medump to go ahead and do medium precision uh, for our shader. And so typically most examples will usually use medium, but this is where you can go ahead and set low or high uh, depending on what you're looking for. And then we need to go ahead and close up our if statement. So then the other key piece, like we said, is we need to go ahead and add our main function. Uh, so we'll go ahead and add in our main, and then we'll go ahead and add in our brackets. And then what we're gonna do is we need to go ahead and set our GL frag color variable. So then that way our shader program will go ahead and set the color of the pixel that we're trying to render out. And so to go ahead and do this, uh, we're gonna go ahead and just leave this blank for a second. And so, uh, as I was saying before, because we're using some of the built-in uh, shader classes that Phaser has, is when this shader runs, we're going to get a number of variables that we can reference depending on which type of pipeline or shader class we're extending. And so two of the most common ones that we're going to get is this first one is going to be varying, and it's going to be a vector two, and it's called out text coordinate. And what this variable is, this is our coordinate from our vertex shader. So before our fragment shader runs, our vertex shader is going to output what is our coordinate which of our pixel that we're currently processing. And so this out text coordinate is going to, oh, and we don't want text, we just want texture, so out texture coordinate. This is just going to give us uh, our X and Y value of which pixel is in our scene so then that way we can process that particular uh, pixel. Our second variable that we're going to use and that we get is going to be called a uniform and it's a sampler uh, 2D. And what this is, and so we're just going to go ahead and give it a name. And so for the name, it's going to be called U main sampler. And so by default, uh, when we use the post FX pipeline, uh, we'll get one uh, texture and this is going to be our U main sampler. And so basically when this pipeline runs, whatever texture is currently applied to that game object or our camera that we're rendering, we're gonna go ahead and get that texture. And then that way with that texture, we can grab our color and then do something with it. It could be as simple as rendering it out or maybe mixing it with another color to get some really cool effects. And so now that we have our two main variables, what we're gonna go ahead and do is now we're gonna use our texture 2D uh, function to go ahead and grab our color of the pixel that we're currently processing. And so to do that, the first thing we do is we need to provide a texture that we're going to grab our color from. And so this is going to be our U, means U main sampler. And so this is going to tell our function that, hey, from this texture, we want to grab a color from this coordinate that we specify. So this here, and we'll go ahead and save. And so what this is going to do then is when our shader runs, basically it's going to take whatever texture we're rendering out and it's going to go ahead and just uh, render out the same color that we had before. And so now that we've defined our fragment shader code, we need to pass that to our pipeline. So now that way our pipeline knows to run that code. And so to do that in our super method, uh, we're just going to do frag shader 
and we're gonna reference our variable, so frag. Oh, I'm gonna go ahead and fix our name, so it's gonna be pipeline. So now that we've defined our custom post-processing pipeline, we need to tell our phaser three scene to go ahead and use this. And so what we'll do is let's jump back over to our nothing post effects scene. And in order to do this, the first thing we need to do is we need to tell phaser about our custom pipeline. We need to add it to our game. So then that way we can use it. And so in order to do this, we need to reference our game's renderer. And then that way we can go ahead and add it. So what we'll go ahead and do is we're gonna reference our renderer from our current phaser uh, game instance. And so this is going to either be our canvas renderer if we're rendering our game out in canvas, or if we're using WebGL, it's going to be our WebGL renderer. And so in our main.ts file, when we created our game definition for our configuration, we pointed to WebGL. So due to that, we know that our renderer is going to go ahead and be a phaser renderer.webgl, and it's going to be a WebGL renderer. So one thing to know is for you to use shaders in your phaser game, you have to use the uh, WebGL type uh, in your game configuration. And so if you use auto, phaser will try to use WebGL if it's available, uh, but it can fall back to canvas. All right, so once we have our renderer, we can then use the pipelines method to grab our pipeline uh, manager. And from our manager, we can go ahead and add a brand new pipeline. And so we're gonna call add post pipeline. And now we just need to provide the name. So the unique key for our pipeline that we're adding and then the pipeline itself. And so we don't wanna create an instance of it, we just wanna pass our class. And so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm just gonna copy our class name here. We'll use that for our key. And then now we need to provide our instance. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just paste that and then let it get imported. All right, so when our scene refreshes, it looks like nothing happened. And that's because all we've done is we've just added our pipeline to our pipeline manager, but we've not actually told anything to actually use it. To actually use it, we need to use it on one of our game objects or even our camera in our scene. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and update our camera to use our, our, po our new pipeline. So to do that, we just reference our camera in our existing scene. So we'll go cameras, let's grab our main camera and we're gonna set our post pipeline. And for this, we wanna go ahead and use our nothing post FX pipeline. All right, perfect. So when our scene restarts, we it should look the same as it did before. However, um, it doesn't look like anything's actually happening. But what is happening is after we render out our scene, our camera is now calling our post pipeline on every update method to go ahead and apply our shader to it. And we can see it being rendered here. And so just to see something, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna jump back over to our pipeline and we're gonna go ahead and add a new method. And we're just gonna call this on free render. And so what this does is when our pipeline is going to be ran, so before it actually runs our code, this method is called for every uh, tick of our game loop. And so this allows us to provide custom variables and set custom values on our pipeline that we can use in our fragment shader code. And we'll get more to that later. Uh, but what we can do for it right now is we can just do a console log and I'm just going to console log R so we can see that something's happening. And so now when our scene refreshes, we'll see right away in our console log, our code is being ran quite frequently. And so what's happening is for every tick of our game loop, our pre-render methods being called for our pipeline. And we can see that happening here. And so this example isn't very exciting, but what it does give us is a working base of using a pipeline to go ahead and create a shader and use it in our game. And so this is our base and it gives us a good starting point of how we can use some of the built-in functions and variables uh, to do something in our game. And so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna work on updating our frag color uh, variable here to go ahead and output a color. And then we'll look at how we can do a more advanced example of using like the built-in mix function to mix that color with our texture to go ahead and create things like a grayscale effect. All right, so to go ahead and update our pipeline to go ahead and do something simple like render a basic color, what we need to do is we just need to go ahead and update our GL frag color variable here to have a new vector for uh, value of the color we want to render out. Uh, so like in the example of four, uh, one thing, the key thing to remember is our GL frag color. This is going to be the color of the pixel we're currently processing that we want to output to our scene. And so right now we're just using the exact same color that we get from our texture. And so what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna go ahead and comment this out. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and reference our GL frag color variable. And we're gonna go ahead and make a new uh, vector four. And so with our vector four, uh, we can go ahead and provide our floats for our RGB. And so we're gonna go ahead and just start with black. 
And so we'll have our red, green, and blue. We're gonna set all of our values to zero. So for your vector four, it's always a number between zero and one. And then we can go ahead and provide our alpha. So then we'll go ahead and set this to one. And we'll need to make sure we can keep our semicolons in order for our program to run. Otherwise, what will happen is if we're missing one, uh, we'll get a big error when we try to create our shader program. So what we should see right away is when our scene restarts, now we have a black screen. And so what's happening is our shader is now being called uh, for every update of our game loop. And for each of our pixels, all we're doing is we're just replacing and we're saying, hey, for this pixel, I want it to be this color. We just want it to be the color black. And so if we go ahead and change our alpha as an example, we can go ahead and modify our color. So no longer just black. Now we have a gray color because we're doing our black and we're making it a little bit transparent. Likewise, if we just want to make it very colorful, uh, we could just do, you know, red. Um, we could apply some green to it. So we could do like 0.4. And let's go ahead and throw in some blue and we can do point two. And so we'll see here now by mixing in our various colors and providing different values, uh, we can go ahead and create uh, different colors in our scene. All right, so not a very exciting example, but what we see now is now we can see how we can make our own colors and apply that to our pixels. And now we can go ahead and do some more advanced, te advanced techniques like mixing two colors together. And so there's a built-in function called mix. And what it allows you to do is provide a starting color and an ending color. And it's going to provide you a new color that's somewhere in between them. And what you can do with this is now we can take the color of our original pixel and apply another color to it to go ahead and give it a tint. Or, and what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and do like a grayscale effect. And so to see an example of this, uh, let's go ahead and comment this out. And what we'll do is let's go ahead and grab our GL frag color variable. And what we want to do is we don't want to replace the whole variable. We just want to replace our RGB values on it. And so what this allows us to do is reference those properties. And now we can call a function that's only going to return those three values and we can go ahead and set them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and call the mix function. And so the mix function is one of the built-in functions for our WebGL. And we can go ahead and use this function to take our two colors and mix them together. And so how it works is we can define what we want to pass in. So for our example, we'll be passing in vector threes. And so what that expects is us to provide two vector threes, so two colors, our X and Y, and then some type of weight between those to get our new resulting color. And so how this works is we provide our first color. Uh, so like this example here, we have this bluish color, our color B, so like this yellow color, and then we have a percent, uh, percent value from zero to one to mix them together. So as an example here, if we do 0% when we mix them, we're gonna get blue. Likewise, if we do a full percent one, we're gonna get yellow. But along that line, depending on what you provide, you will get that new resulting color because they're being mixed together. And so we'll get like this purple color if we do somewhere in the middle. And so what we can do in our game is we can use the original color of the pixel from our image that we want to render out and then mix it with a color to create a tint. And so go ahead and do this. The first thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and set our GL frag color variable to our original pixel color. And so we'll use our texture 2D method to grab it from our texture that's passed in. In our mix function, uh, we're going to go ahead and first pass our vector 3 for our existing pixel. And so what we'll do is our GL frag color, we'll grab our RGB value to make it a vector three instead of a vector four. And then we can go ahead and specify a new vector three of the color we wanna go ahead and have as the result. And so for this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our existing color from our pixel, and we're gonna multiply it by another value to go ahead and get our gray color. And so what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to do 0 0.2126. We're going to multiply that by our GL frag color and we'll do our red first. And so what we need to do is provide our three values. And so we do that by using the plus here. And so now we want to go ahead and grab our green value. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and copy this block of code here. I'm going to go ahead and paste it. And then for our green color, we're going to go ahead and multiply that by a different number. And so what we'll do is we'll do zero, we'll do seven, we'll do one, five, two. And now we just need to go ahead and do our blue. So let's go ahead and do add and we will add in that block. And so now we need to make sure we grab our blue channel and we want to go ahead and multiply this by 0 0.07 and we'll do two, two. And then we just need to uh, specify the percent value. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to do one. And so that way we use that full value. 
So now when we save and our scene refreshes, we'll see right away, now we get this gray color applied to our scene. And so what's happening is we have our original texture, uh, which was our colorful image, and we're grabbing that value and we're setting that to our pixel. We're then overwriting our RGB value uh, to be the result of our mix function call here. And so what we saw with our mix function, we specify our two vectors for our two colors and our percent that we want to be applied uh, to the resulting color. And so what we did is we took our original R, G, and B uh, channels from our original color and we multiplied them by another value to get our new color. So then that way, our colors will be somewhere between our existing color and then this new modified value, uh, so gray. And then we went ahead and just applied a full percent so we get this effect here. And so what we can do is we can play around with these values to get different results. So now we see here if we don't apply our full 1.0, now we have our gray kind of applied to our image. And so it gets like a more lighter color. And so we can see just by tweaking some of our values, we get some really interesting results uh, just by modifying these here. And so likewise, what I could do is let's say if I wanna make this 0 0.6, now we get a completely different color. Uh, maybe we'll do 0 0.1 and now we're making it darker. And then for our blue, uh, let's go ahead and make that 0.4. And so just by playing around our colors, we get some really cool effects. And so I'm just going to revert those so we have our gray skull color. All right, so so far our shaders have been pretty static. And what I mean by this is for our existing examples where we want to just use a single color or mix another color with our existing texture, our values that we use here are static and they're not dynamic. Uh, typically uh, with our shaders, sometimes we want to do something dynamic based on something that's happening in our game. And so as an example, maybe I wanna go ahead and modify the color that's being applied to our texture that we're outputting. And we wanna make this dynamic based on something like maybe like time. So as our time goes by, our color would change to create like a different rainbow effect in our game. And in order to do this, what we'd have to do is we'd have to introduce a new variable to our shader program that we can go ahead and modify from our game code and provide a new value. And luckily this is actually really easy to do uh, with our pipelines in Phaser. And so what we would have to do is first, we need to go ahead and add a new variable to our program. And so in order to do this, we just need to go ahead and define a new variable outside of our main function here in our shader program. Uh, so what we'll do is we're gonna go ahead and let's comment this out here. And what we'll do is we'll go back to our simple example of where we just set a color to our pixel that's being outputted. And what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna make one of these values dynamic based on our variable. And so what we'll do is we'll make a new uniform and we're gonna go ahead and call this, flo uh, for the type, it'll be a float. And I'm just gonna call this uh, u and then test. And what I'm gonna do with this new variable is I'm gonna go ahead and just replace our red value here with our new variable. And then down in our pipeline, we just need to go ahead and set this value and pass it into our program. And so to do that, this is where our on pre-render method uh, comes in. So because this method is called before we actually run our shader code uh, for each of our pixels, uh, we can go ahead and set that value here. And so to do this, we just need to reference our pipeline and then we're gonna use a special method called set1f. And what this allows you to do is set a 1f uniform value based on the name you provide and then the value you want to set to it. And so how this method works is the name we provide needs to match the variable we defined in our shader program. And so you test, I'm gonna do this here. And now we need to go ahead and give it the value we wanna go ahead and set. And so for our floats, it should be a value between zero and one. And so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm just gonna go ahead and do 1.0. Uh, so then that way it's the same red value we had before. And I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of our console log. And then I'm gonna go ahead and save. So now when our scene refreshes, it doesn't look like anything happened. But what's happening now is we're setting our variable u test, and now it's being modified here. And we're using that in our main program. And it's changing based on where this value is here. So what we can go ahead and do is let's go ahead and say, I want to set this to 0 0.25. Now we can see that our variable is affecting our program for our red value. So whatever we specify here, it's going to be applied to our game. All right, so to make this a little bit more interesting, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to make this value more dynamic by exposing it on our class here. And then what we're going to do is our game is running. We're going to modify this value. So then that way our color that's being applied will be changed for all every single tick of our game loop. 
And so to go ahead and do this, uh, we'll need to make a new property on our class. Uh, so then that way we can make this dynamic. So I'm gonna just make a private property and I'm gonna call this progress. And what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go ahead and set this equal to, uh, we're gonna set our type to be a number. And then our constructor, I'm gonna go ahead and set this to be a zero when our instance is first created. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add a getter and a setter so we can actually set this value. And so we'll do get progress. This is going to return a number. And so we're gonna return this progress. And then we'll go ahead and do set and we'll do progress. And what we'll do is we'll have a new value, which will be a number. And we're gonna go ahead and set this equal to be this. Our progress will be equal to our val value. So then what we'll do is down in our pre-render method, instead of having a hard-coded 0.7, we're just gonna go ahead and do this.progress. All right, so when our scene refreshes, now we have this blue color because it starts off at zero. Now back in our scene, what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna go ahead and just use a simple tween to go ahead and modify our value. So to do that, we're just gonna do this, our tween manager, we're gonna call the add method to go ahead and add a brand new tween. And now we need to provide our target. So for our target, we're gonna go ahead and reference our cameras, our main camera, and now we wanna get our post pipeline that we've created. And so for our pipeline, we just need to go ahead and provide the same name that we set here when we added our pipeline. All right, so now we have our target, and now we need to specify which property we want to modify. And we want to modify our progress property on our post pipeline. And so how the tween works is whatever properties we specify here, we can modify their values um, from that instance. And because now we have a property called progress, we can actually modify it. And then what we need to do is specify the value that we want to tween to. So since we start off at uh, zero, we're gonna go ahead and progress up to the value of one. And now for our tween, we need to specify our duration. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do two seconds. And we're gonna do a delay. And I'm just gonna do one second so we don't start off right away. And then I'm gonna go ahead and do repeat. And I'm gonna put negative one. Uh, so it should repeat forever. And one last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do yo-yo. And so then that way it goes from zero to one and then one back to zero. And so now we can see after our tween starts and it has that delay, now we get this really cool effect where we're changing our color that's being applied in our shader. And so basically how this works is we're just using one of our built-in tweens to modify our new custom property on our pipeline class. So our progress value, and we're having go between zero and one and because in our on pre-render method in our pipeline, we're using that value to set our variable. And so what happens is every time our shader program runs for every single one of our pixels for our game loop, now we have that dynamic uTest variable applied to our shader. And so we can see just by using some of the built-in methods, we get some really cool effects uh, from our shader here. All right, so now that we've seen how we can use variables to make our shaders a little bit more dynamic, the next thing we're gonna look at is how we can apply our shader to only some of our pixels on our screen. And in order to do this, what we can do is just like our regular code, we can add if statements inside our shader program. So then that way we have conditional logic that'll run based on some type of variable. And so what we'll do is we're gonna go ahead and extend our example here that uses our variable and we're going to use that to go ahead and determine if we should go ahead and render something out or something else. And so what this will result in is we'll have a nice shader where it's going to be allow us to do a simple scene transition where like we'll have a slide effect on our scene. And so to go ahead and do this, what we're going to go ahead and do is in our shader, uh, what we're going to, to do in our program is I'm going to go ahead and modify our U test uh, variable name. I'm just going to call this U uh, cutoff. We're going to do U cutoff. And then real quick, I'm gonna go ahead and comment out this line of code. All right, so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna write some code real quick and then we'll come back and review what it does. And so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make a conditional. Uh, so we can use an if statement to do this. And then I'm gonna go ahead and reference our out text coordinate variable here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab our X value from it. And I'm gonna compare it to our variable here. So our U cutoff variable. And so if it's less than this value, then we're gonna go ahead and render out one way if it is not less than that value, then we can eld add our else block to do something else. And this would let us render something completely different. And so what I'm gonna do is if our value 
is not less than our variable, we're just gonna go ahead and render out our original pixel color that we set. If it is less than our cutoff value, then what we're gonna go ahead and do is, I'm gonna go ahead and just render out a basic color of black. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna copy this, we're gonna go ahead and paste, and for our black color, we're just going to get rid of all these, and we're gonna do 0, 0.0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so what we're doing is now when our shader program runs, we're gonna have our cutoff variable, which is a value between zero and one, and we're gonna use that variable and compare it to our pixel that we're currently processing. And so for each of our pixels, because it is a coordinate, it has an X and Y value. And what that means is we can figure out where on our scene our pixels currently uh, tie to. And so what it does is we're gonna have a value between zero and one. And so like in our phase we're seeing, our coordinates gonna stop are up here in the top left corner and we'll have zero all the way to the right of our screen where it's a value of one. And so that's gonna be our X value. Our Y value is gonna be zero in the top left corner all the way down to the bottom where it's one. And so what we can do is we get this really cool effect now where we can compare our coordinates position to some value and then render out something conditionally based on that. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go ahead and save. I'm gonna come back to our scene and I'm gonna comment out our tween real quick. And then what I'm gonna go ahead and do is when our constructor, when we set our value, I'm gonna go ahead and set this equal to 0 0.2. Oh, and one more change we need to do is on our on pre-render method, because we changed our variable name, we need to go ahead and update that from U test to be U cut off. All right, so now when our scene refreshes, now we can see something's happening. And what's happening is now we have this black bar on our scene. And so if I bump this value to like 0 0.5, what's happening is now for all of our pixels, when it runs, we're saying, hey, for our X coordinate, is it less than our cutoff point? So this value here, if it is, we wanna go ahead and render out black. If it's not, we're rendering out our original color. And so what we can see now is as we change this value, our black bar is expanding over our scene until it completely encapsulates it if we have a value of one. And so what's now really cool is with our shader, what we can do is we come back to our code. Let's go ahead and add our tween back in. And now what should happen is now it should create this very nice effect where we can have this really cool transition. So we can have this black bar slide across our scene by applying it to our camera. And because we do have this yo-yo effect, we can see that it closes and then it opens. And so what we could do is we could have a black bar open when our scene starts, and then we can have it close uh, when we transition to another scene. We could also do something else where we could also use our Y value in this equation. And so what we could do is we can say, and if our Y value is also less than our text coordinate, we can now modify our code and we can get some really cool effects depending on what's happening. As now we see by using both of these, we see we get this new effect where we have like this rectangle that's expanding until it gets all the way to our top corner. And like if we change this to an or, we even get another effect now where now we have a rectangle where we're kind of closing in on that top corner. All right, so now we can see that just by using a few simple variables and then modifying our game code to modify those variables that are passed into our program, we can create some really cool effects. All right, so now that we looked at how we can build some simple shaders by using our own code, what we're gonna do real quick is we're gonna take a look at one of the built-in examples that we have from Phaser. And so uh, what I did is I went ahead and reverted our code back to where we have just our simple grayscale. I'm gonna go ahead and switch back to our scene. And then what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna add in one more image game object. And so uh, if we switch over to our code, I'm gonna go ahead and come into our scenes and I'm gonna go to our built-in FX scene. And what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm just gonna copy this code here for the sprite sheet, move that over to our current scene, pull that to our preload method. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy our asset key here. We'll add that to the top of our scene. And then we wanna go ahead and create one more game object. So I'm gonna go ahead and create one uh, for our character. And so I'm just gonna copy this one here. We have our const character. And let's go ahead and add that in. And so what that's gonna do is it's gonna add one new image game object to our scene, so be a little bit bigger. And so our character is being rendered in grayscale. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and apply another shader to our character so in that way it looks a little bit differently. And so to go ahead and do this, we can reference our game object. And I'm gonna go ahead and reference prefx. This is gonna reference our prefx component on our game object. 
And this is a built-in uh, component to allow us to apply special effects to our game objects before they're rendered to our scene. And so this could be uh, really cool for effects like glow, blur. Um, if you want to do like vin, uh, so this is really cool for effects like glow, blur, bloom, etc. And so then what we can do is if we reference this component, now we can reference a bunch of methods that is going to add all kinds of effects to our game object. And so we can see things that like we have that bloom and blur. We can do like a glow, we can add a gradient, uh, we can do all kinds of things. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the add gradient method. And then this allows us to specify our colors that we wanna use for our gradient. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do zero X, zero, 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 zero. So we're gonna have a blue color and we're going to also do a green color. So we'll do zero X, zero, zero, FF, zero, zero. And then we wanna specify our alpha and so I'm just gonna go ahead and do zero. So now if we go ahead and take a look at our scene, what's happening is not only on our camera are we applying our grayscale effect to our whole scene that's being rendered, but we're now also using a special pipeline on our individual game object to apply a special effect to that. And so what's happening is we're adding this gradient here to our character game object, and then we're taking our whole scene and applying a new shader on top of it to get a grayscale effect. So now our gradient that had color is now being colored gray. And so to see a difference, we'll go ahead and comment out our code where we set our post pipeline for our camera. Now what we'll see is our game object now has this gradient being applied to the whole texture for that individual object instead of being applied to our whole scene because we're using our camera. And so by mixing the two, we can create some really cool effects in our game by applying our shaders to what we want to use in our game. All right, because our camera is a game object, we can also apply some of the built-in effects there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do our camera, our main camera. I'm going to reference our post FX component. And then I'm going to go ahead and let's, uh, I'm going to add another gradient. And for this one, I'm just going to go ahead and do the color red. So, so 0x, FF, 0, 0, 0, 0. And I'm going to leave the rest at default. And so now what's going to happen is when our scene renders, we apply our first special effect to our game object. And then for our camera, we're now applying a new effect after everything's rendered. And so we get this gradient applied over our whole scene. Uh, so as you can see, by using WebGL and the awesome Phaser 3 framework, we can create some really cool game effects by using shaders. As I mentioned, the topics of shaders is very vast and I can't go over everything in one video, but there are some excellent resources out there if you want to learn more. And I hope with some of the examples shown here, you can see that shaders are pretty cool. All right, with that, that brings this video to an end. Uh, so as a reminder, there is a link in the description of the video with source code for this video. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy the content. If you did enjoy the video, please consider liking the video and hitting the bell icon to be notified when the next video in the series is released. For more great Phaser 3 content, please see the links on your screen now.